mes- in the message, are you listening to this? Really listening? Jesus is making the point that these stories are important. In fact, they are crucial to have a clear understanding of who he is and what the kingdom of heaven is all about. So as we dive into these stories today, for for us today, particularly hidden treasures, fine pearls, and fishing nets, my question to you is, are you listening to this? Really listening? Now you need to know when a person preaches, often he or she she sees everything that's going on in the room. I see the person who falls asleep. In fact, in my church back in Oakville, I had a man in my congregation. I had the gift of giving him rest. Because as soon as I, as soon as I would start, I would see him, his eyes go, go like this, and he was gone. But if you're tempted to drift off into another land of sleep here today, I encourage you, open your Bibles, open your device, look at Matthew 13, and feast on these stories that Jesus is sharing. Uh, So, are you listening, really listening? We need to consider what the intention of Jesus is and the application of Matthew. So, people are concerned about, who is this Jesus? What's what's he doing? what, What is he talking about? His disciples come to him, look at these verses in Matthew 13, verses 10 to 12. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, and this this should come up on the screen, he replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. Let's keep these words on the screen just for a moment. These are strange, aren't they? Communicators, people who preach, want to make sure we can get our points across. That's why we use PowerPoint. That's why we give you an outline to to grab when you come in so you can track with what we're saying. But Jesus is saying in these words that the reason he speaks in parables is so that some people will get it and, and other people won't. It's kind of a shocking thing. And sometimes when we come here to Grace Chapel on a Sunday morning, we need to pray and say, Lord, I'm open to hearing what you want to say to me in the message that is given, in the scriptures that are read, in the worship that takes place here. Lord, what do you want to communicate to my heart today? He says, and I had these words in bold in your outline, it says, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you. The mystery of what God is doing in fact, uh, Chantal and I were talking yesterday. I went down the, lo- the, um, down the hallway near the children's center, and they're starting a new series about the mystery uh, of God being revealed. So neat that we're kind of doing the same thing at the same time. Uh, Jesus is saying to his disciples, some people will get these stories, and other people, it'll go right over their heads. They won't hear it or experience it or be impacted by it at all. In fact, in these, these passages that we're looking at today talk about an insider-outsider distinction. Some people get the good news, and some people don't. And there's an area of election here of God choosing people and bringing them into his kingdom that we have to struggle with and we need to consider. But in verses 16 and 17 of Matthew 13, Jesus says to his disciples, But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. He's saying to them, and I think these words apply to us as well, you are privileged people. Because what God is doing, what God is revealing at this time, people for the longs for centuries anticipated the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus says, here I am. Here is the good news uh, that God is talking about. Here is the kingdom of heaven coming into existence, coming into work. I have a sense here that the people are going to be given greater insights into kingdom truths. That people are able to appreciate when they listen to these stories and somehow the Holy Spirit works on them and gives them clearer understanding all of a sudden they understand more about what what God is doing. 
This is one of the reasons why I think corporate worship is important. Elizabeth and team, thank you so much today for reminding us of the goodness of God. All my life you've been faithful. All my life you've been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. And sometimes we can be so busy going here, there, and everywhere that we don't stop and take stock and give God praise for what he's done. But when we come together and worship like this, when Brian leads us in prayer, we quiet our hearts, we reflect on our lives, and we can't but help thank God for what he's done. You know, for in verses 16 and 17, again, generations, prophets, righteous people, the people that we read about in the Old Testament that God used for good would have loved to have been there in the time of Jesus. But he says, you are a privileged people right now. In verses uh, 34 to 36, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophets. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. So do you have ears to hear this morning uh, what God is saying? Do you have ears to hear uh, what uh, Jesus is communicating to the crowd? This won't come up on the screen, but if you have your Bibles open to Matthew 13, look at verses 14 and following. He says this, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. We're going, to be preach- we're going to be doing a series on Isaiah in just a short period of time, and we're going to preach on this passage. You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. Are your eyes open? Are your ears ready to receive what God wants to communicate uh, to you today? Every one of us could think about that and answer that uh, in our own hearts. I'm very thankful for Paul's message last week when he gave us this, uh, this idea, and it'll come up on the screen. The kingdom of heaven is progressive, personal, and participatory. I practiced that word, Paul, a couple of times. Progressive in the sense that it's continuing to come ahead. It's continuing to move. So even when we live in a world where we see a lot of pain, a lot of difficulties, a lot of hardships, God's kingdom is progressing. God's kingdom is moving. It's personal that the kingdom of God isn't just some thing that's out there, but it starts in our lives and starts by bringing change to us. And it's participatory, meaning that we have the incredible opportunity ourselves to do something with it. So this isn't isn't just something we think about, but it's something that we enter into with God and we could do amazing things. Why, Why have we been encouraging you to do the shape exercise, spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experience? Why are we encouraging you to do that survey and consider it? Because we don't want you just to sit there. <laughs> we don't want you just to be there and be say, Lord, give me more knowledge and more understanding about things. But we want you to get your hands dirty, whatever that might look like. That might be giving gifts of mercy to those who need it. It might be fixing somebody's car. It might be spending time and encouraging a lonely person. These are all things that God calls us to participate in the kingdom of heaven. This is something God wants us all to do. So finally, after that long introduction, we're to my stories. The stories of hidden treasures and fine pearls. Have you ever found something that really got you excited? I was just last summer walking across the Costco parking lot and I saw it right there. I was so happy. I went down and I picked it up. A $5 bill. (laughs) <laughs> you, know, just, you know, I got five bucks. It was really great, right? Put it in my pocket, went into the store. Yeah, 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 it was the blue one. Yeah, yeah, it was yours, yeah. Later on, I reached into my pocket and realized I lost the 20. <laughs> and it was like, ah, oh, you know. Uh, but, but when we find something that's valuable, it, it gives us great joy, right? But we're really excited about it. And Jesus tells this story to the people. And again, I love the masterful way that Jesus tells stories. 
Look at these verses from 44 to 46. Jesus, again, is talking about the kingdom of heaven, and I have it bold in a different color uh, on our slide. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Let's dive into the story of these two stories this morning. Back in the times of Jesus, uh, people didn't have the local branch of the RBC where you could have a safety deposit box and put your valuables. If you had something valuable that you didn't want someone else to get, you might have a special spot on your plot of land or in your area where you would dig, dig a hole and, and put it in there and cover it up carefully and hope that nobody finds it. But if you forget about that treasure, uh, if you end up moving away and forgot to take it with you, some other person comes along, finds that treasure, and is you know, so happy. I read a story last year in England about someone doing renovations on their house, and they were digging somewhere in the kitchen or something along these lines, and they found a bunch of old, valuable Roman coins worth, worth like a, a fortune. So exciting uh, to, to find something like this. And so I can imagine all the people when they're listening to, to this story uh, about a person who finds treasure, they say, oh, that would be so good. Yeah, like, that would be so nice to have something like that to happen to me. In the same way, the story about the merchant who's selling pearls, he finds this great pearl and he, he puts it away. What Jesus is communicating in these stories is this. The kingdom of heaven is supremely valuable. Not just like it's, it's, a, good, it's a good thing, it's a wonderful thing, it's somewhat, uh, it is supremely valuable. It's above and beyond a, a, anything else that you can imagine. I, I, like, I like watching the show The Antiques Roadshow. You know, this, this is a show that's on PBS and people have things that they have and they bring them into a, a, a gathering like this and there's a few people who are experts in the particular field. And this one story I saw from 2012, it took place. A woman brought in this little demi table that, that she had found. It was just like a half table that would go in a hallway. You might play cards on it. And she brought it in. And the, the Kino brothers, Leslie and uh, Lee Kino twins, who have a, a, an appreciation and an understanding of antiques, when they saw it come in, they got all excited about this table. The woman said some 30 years earlier, maybe around uh, 1990 or so, she moved into a new town and she needed a table and she went to a garage sale. And a woman was selling this table. The woman wanted 30 bucks for it. She only had... 25, they settled on 25, and she took it home. It was dirty. It was small. But she worked on cleaning it up a little bit and kept it there for a long time, but she thought she'd bring it in to the antique roadshow. Well, when the Kino brothers saw it, their hearts started to go like this. And they talked to the woman about the table and how she got it and so on. And they made, they made an assumption, uh, they made an assessment of that table as saying that table is probably worth $300,000. She paid 25 bucks for it. A short time later, when it went to auction at Sotheby's auction house, it sold for 490,000 US dollars. Wow. <laughs> you know, there, there, is, there is something valuable here. Uh, but I, I tell you this story because this, the kingdom of heaven is supremely valuable above and beyond anything else that we can imagine. What is it that you put value on in your life? The possessions that you have? The career that you're working in? Uh, the relationships that you have? Your health? All this? All of this pales in comparison to being a part of the kingdom of God. To being a part of the kingdom of heaven and having God at work in us. Jesus is communicating this, and when they hear these stories, the people who are listening to him, the, his disciples, and just the crowds that are there, they're evaluating their lives and saying, what is it? They put a, a, a kind of a big emphasis on. 
The kingdom of heaven is supremely valuable. I also get the idea of this, that the kingdom of heaven requires a radical response. I think the first story is kind of funny, right? The guy's in the field, he digs a hole, he finds the treasure. He buries the treasure, walks slowly away, tries to be cool like nobody notices it, right? Buys the land for some value. He's kind of ripping off the guy who owns the property already, but uh, no. Interesting people would laugh at that. Or the pearl merchant sells everything and comes in big time for this. The kingdom of heaven requires a radical response. You can't just have a little bit of Jesus. Uh, You can't just be a little bit of a follower of Jesus. You're all in or you're not in at all. One of the things I love when I meet people who've had a, a, a life that's been really tough, you know, people maybe who struggle with addictions where their life's been on the edge for a long time. I remember in my previous church, I sat across a man at a table and he was there with his wife and child. And uh, we had a presentation by uh, Teen Challenge. And um, this is in Ontario. And so I asked the, uh, the man across the table from me, I said, um, uh, what, do you do in the, what do you do for Teen Challenge? He goes, I'm in the program. You see, he started using cocaine, and his cocaine habit got off on him. And all of a sudden, he was like, you know, hundred grand, a hundred thousand dollars that he snorted, and so on. And his, he was on a on a path to disaster. But then God changed him, and he's in the program. He says, the only way I can get back to be with my wife and child would be to stay in this residential program for a year to get clean, so I could do something with God. But what radical response may God be calling you to do to enter into the kingdom of heaven? When you think about the goodness of God, how much God has blessed you, how willing are you to step out and do something radical for for God? Again, what you do will be different than what I do. And I don't anticipate this person do what I'm doing necessarily. I'm going to do what he is doing. But God has something intended for each one of us. And when you participate in it, I'll tell you, folks, it's a beautiful, wonderful, amazing thing. Jesus goes on in verses 47 and 50. Again, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be in the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, what is Jesus, what's his intention in telling this story? What are the people hearing uh, in this? An idea that I get is this. The kingdom of heaven is supremely valuable. It requires a radical response. And the kingdom of heaven is often messy. You know, I've had the privilege of being in pastoral life since 1987. That's a long time. But it's a time when I've seen, oh, so many wonderful, beautiful things. And I've seen other things that have broken my heart. Conflicts, troubles, people making messes. You know, why is it that in a church, like the Christian church, where people are supposed to be following Christ, There's issues of abuse, sexual abuse of children, violence in homes. It's messy when you get alongside in people's lives and you're helping them unpack things and sort things out. It's confusing and hard. But as people of faith, we're called to enter into this mess. I don't particularly like fishing. Putting worms on hooks, not my deal, right? Not, Not too much. A couple of summers ago, we were traveling with friends up to St. Anthony, the northern part of Newfoundland. And we went back into a little village, a little fishing village just outside of St. Anthony. And there was a a man there on his dock cleaning out his um, cod catch. And he's gutting these fish. He's outside and he's just throwing what he doesn't want right back into the ocean and something will eat it, I guess, and so on. And I thought, yeah, that's kind of like the kingdom of heaven sometimes, right? Right? It's messy because it involves broken people. 
It's messy because it's going into parts of the world where there's so much grief and, and hardship. But we, we don't go into this mess uh, without knowing that God is going with us and God has given us strength for it. Uh, another, um, another truth I get from this story that Jesus is telling is this. The kingdom of heaven will be cleaned up by God. We don't like to talk about this very often. But there will be a judgment time when God will set things right. And for people who have done horrific things to other people, God will deal with that. I don't have to deal with it. But, but God will. This is how it will be in the end of the age. It says in verses, I think, 49 and 50, the angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I say, Lord, give me faith. Give me courage to enter into this mess that's existing in this world and trust that you will make it right in the end. At the beginning, at the end of the, uh, the first story of the, uh, the seeds that are being sown, uh, the sower, Jesus says, are you listening to this? Really listening? And then at the end of these stories, he says in verse 51 and following, Jesus asked, are you starting to get a handle on this? They answered yes. He said, then you will see how every student well-trained in God's kingdom is like the owner of a general store who could put his hands on anything you need, old or new, exactly when you need it. Let's just unpack that a little bit. Remember the context of Matthew 11 through 13. The authority is being kind of challenged by the religious leaders primarily about who Jesus is. And Jesus is saying that if you really understand what I'm talking about, the kingdom of heaven, you will see that a better perspective of what's going on is that in the person of Jesus and his work, is the kingdom of heaven is being established. And then the people who really understand these things, it says in the NIV, this won't come up on the screen. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. In other words, you'll get it. You'll see it. You'll know that God is at work. So I want to encourage us as the people of Grace Chapel, to open our ears, open our eyes to see what God is doing, and then step into it and enjoy the ride. Amen. I have a special gift for you right now. Elizabeth.